Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 87. Have you wanted to work with RSS feeds in Python? Maybe you're looking for a new project to build your portfolio that uses Django, unit tests, and custom commands. This week on the show, we have Real Python author Ricky White to talk about his recent step by step project titled Build a Content Aggregator in Python. Ricky's been authoring the Real Python interview series for several years and was formerly our community manager. He talks about what inspired him to create this project and the Python technology and libraries to build it. He also shares advice about adding tests to personal portfolio projects. We start the show by discussing Python's GIL, the global interpreter lock, and the efforts to potentially remove it in future versions of Python. This change could make a significant impact on Python code running on multi-core processors. We talk about two recent articles covering the developments. This episode is brought to you by CloudSmith. CloudSmith is a secure software supply chain management tool for your Python packages and dependencies. Try CloudSmith for free at cloudsmith.com slash sign up. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Ricky. It's so great to have you on the program. It's great to be here, Chris. All right. I want to start off just by congratulating you on your uh, citizenship. Thanks. It um, took a while, but <laughs> we got there in the end. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. How long was the process? Uh, actually longer than it, than it could have been. Um, so it's one of those strange things that when I came into the country uh, as a green card holder, they told me, you know, it, I needed, I could apply for citizenship after, you know, I think it was five years. So I waited for five years to allow, but at some point the rules changed and I could have applied after three years. So, but uh. no one tells you that the rules changed. So. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a little over that. So I, I, I moved to the U.S. in October 2014, so and I became a citizen uh, at the end of September this year, so which is 20, 2021. If you're you know listening in the future, but um, right, yeah, so yeah, I mean it's a, it's a long process, but you know you kind of have to. There's a lot of paperwork and yeah. Are you, so you're keeping it as a dual citizenship thing? Well, kind of not. No, I mean, so the U.S. has rules about dual citizenship. It's a little gray in places. Okay. For travel, I have to use a U.S. passport is, is the crux of it. So the U.K., which is where I'm from, England, they still recognize me as a citizen. Um, but as far as the U.S. is concerned, I'm a U.S. citizen. So and So they don't really do the dual thing so much these days. But I mean that's fine with me. Uh, I mean my my children and are American, and they even though they were born in England, they they were registered as Americans at birth, and they've been here far for most of their life. So they're American, and my wife's American by birth, and so you know it's probably easier if we're all in the same queue at customs and at the <laughs> airport. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. You were working at Real Python for quite a while, and you're still doing some some stuff. The interview series you were doing. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask a, a question about that. How many interviews have you done? <laughs> I guess would be the first one. It's, it's a lot. I mean, I think I just published my 33rd article. They're not all interviews, but majority of them are. So yeah, it's, it's north of 25, yeah, um, if not more. How do you select the subjects? There's a there's not one way. So sometimes I'll might hear a guest on a podcast and steal your guests. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> doing it, doing it, or vice versa, those, <laughs> or vice versa. Yeah. Um. And so sometimes it's people I've met at online, either through Twitter or something like, or Reddit or something. And I just keep an eye out on people in the Python community. And if there's a, a popular article that comes out by somebody that we've not interviewed then we'll or a popular package then then we'll select someone there yeah yeah what were some of your favorite ones you've done 
Oh, I can't pick a favorite. They're all good for different reasons. Right. Yeah, yeah I've not quite... So uh, there's been a few core developers, uh, Python, uh, C Python core developers who I've interviewed. So those are interesting purely for selfish reasons, right? <laughs> I get to ask them questions that I want to ask them. and Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's the fun part, right? But we've had quite a lot of, a variety of, uh, of people interview. And, and, and that's kind of the point of the interviews is it's not a always about the tech it's about the person and it's about um, the stories they have and and that's kind of what i try and eke out a little bit uh, obviously we focus on python a lot yeah I, I i try and put some personality in there too because i think i think it's important for people coming into python that they see that we're not all the same and there's a the python community is very diverse and i want to try and represent that the best i can in the interviews yeah on a side note you're interviewing the guy who hosts the advent of code. Mm. Um, the reason I bring it up is Garana is creating an article about it, and I'm planning on bringing him on the show uh, a couple of days after the av- this year's advent of code starts to kind of talk about that whole process and stuff. And I don't know, I'm, I'm guessing that interview should release um, probably just before that also. Yeah, I think it's probably next week. But yeah, I think I think the plan is, yeah, the interview's done. Eric was kind enough to do the interview. And so we talk about Advent of Code and, and kind of uh, tips and for solving code problems. And yeah, that, that should be out in the next week. I don't think it's this week, but maybe next week it's, it's due to be scheduled. I, I didn't, I haven't looked lately, um, but um, yeah. yeah, then that should come out. And then Gears article should come out either the same week or the week after, yeah, so... Yeah, yeah. And then that's what I'm thinking. We'll do like an interview and kind of right at the top of December, try to get it out that first week there. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, that's kind of fun. Is that something that you've uh, participated in yourself? I have in previous, I I don't think I did it last year, but I have in previous years. I started, I've never finished. Uh, (laughs) I've never finished. (laughs) Not all of them, right? Just some of them. I get about 10 to 14 days through and then life gets in the way or I miss. Yeah. Oh, the, the, I think the hardest part is, is if you miss one day, you could probably make it up. But if you start missing two days in a row and then certainly if you miss three days in a row, there's just then too much catch up to do and it gets really hard to be motivated or make time yeah. to do it. So you've kind of got to be disciplined from the start and make it kind of like, okay, this is something I'm going to do for my own development. Yeah. Uh, and this is important to me and and just commit to it yeah that could be hard during the holidays to do that too it is hard during the holidays and it's especially going to be hard for me to do it this year but it's just something i want to do do again and i want to i want to you know get through the whole thing i'll have to see if he wants to come on the show um for that too i'll try to reach out that might be kind of fun yeah all right cool yeah yeah I wanted to talk about uh, a little bit of news stuff. This is something that Christopher and Trudeau and I mentioned briefly in our last episode. I'm having, you know, there's a couple of reasons to have you on. One is that your recent article about uh, sort of a step by step project, I should correct myself. It's not truly an article, it's more of a whole project and taking people through it of creating this really cool content aggregator in Python. And but I wanted to start off is just talk a little bit about the notes on the meeting about the Python Gill. It was uh, something that, again, we had mentioned a couple weeks ago. Uh, there was this meeting that was held with Sam Gross along with the core Python developers. Lucas wrote an article about it. Basically, the title of it is Notes from the Meeting on Python Gill Removal between Python Core and Sam Gross. And that came out at the end of October. And there was another article recently and this is on lwn.net, and it's from Jonathan Corbett. And it covers a lot of the same sort of stuff, but kind of a slightly different angle. And so I'll, I'll include links for both. That one is titled A Viable Solution for Python Concurrency. To take one step back, I did a interview with Michael Kennedy pretty early on in the podcast. I asked him about the Gill and had him kind of explain it a little bit in terms that hopefully could make sense. But basically, it's called the global interpreter lock. And it's used to help manage objects. When things are created in your Python programs, all these individual objects are created. And that's something that's kind of a repeated theme that you'll hear people talk about when teaching or talking about Python, that everything's sort of an object. But eventually, these objects 
get created or need to be removed as you go along. Otherwise you can eventually run out of memory. And so there's this system that has a reference count that keeps track of all of them. And the big problem with it is one of these things that people talk about sometimes as a hindrance potentially for the speed of Python is that computer CPUs kind of have this higher level limit of like overall speed the way over the last at least decade or more computers have tried to move beyond that is to have multiple cores and then for a language to take advantage of that it would need to divide up what's happening and processing inside of it into what are called threads the problem there is then how can it keep track as to what's happening in that thread and references that are created in those other threads and adding and removing them. And so the global interpreter lock is preventing that. And early guests of the show have talked about this idea of this proposal of something called a sub-interpreter, that these other interpreters could be used and then they could be sent back to kind of do the same kind of thing of like take advantage of these. You know, you look at the processors coming from Apple or from even Intel and, and, and AMD that have multiple, multiple cores. And very often these you know projects that want to take advantage of them sometimes can't. And so Sam Gross, he wrote, a, it's basically a fork of Python 3.9 that's called No Gil, all together N-O-G-I-L. Mm-hmm. I think it's best, maybe I'll just read quickly the TLDR portion of Lucas's article. Sam Sam's work demonstrates it's viable to remove the gill in such a way that the resulting Python interpreter is performant and scales with added CPU cores for performance to be a net positive. Other seemingly unrelated interpreter work is required. So at the moment, it's impossible to merge Sam's changes back to CPython since they're deliberately made against legacy 3.9 branch so that the resulting 3.9 no gill interpreter can be tested by end users with the currently available base of pip installable libraries and C extensions. To merge no gill, the changes will have to be made against the main branch. And that's currently scheduled, as we've talked on the show, how you know it's moving pretty rapidly every this yearly thing. Um, we went from, you know, yeah, it moves quick now. Yeah. Yeah, 3.9 to 3.10, and and we're already scheduled to 3.11. And so don't expect Python 3.11 to drop the gill just yet. Merging Sam's work back to CPython will be laborious. Anyway, so they need to decide how they're going to do it, if they're going to do it. The very last little section of that talks about people mentioning, oh, why not leave it for Python 4? And the core developers are kind of not interested in Python 4 as like this whole convention. And it's basically because of, I don't know, the drama, if you will, of yeah. the transition from Python 2 to 3. It was very hard, and it was hard also not for everybody, but just for the community in general. Mm-hmm. And so it's very early to speculate, let alone worry about Python 4. So it's a good article. It goes way much further into depth. It goes into the questions that were asked of it. So I don't know. I don't, what are your thoughts? Did, I don't know if you've run into this yourself. So I think... No, is the brief answer is no, I don't really run into problems because of the kind of development I do. All right. Most of my slowdown in my code is not because of the gill, it's because of a network traffic or yeah. IO or bad internet because I'm a I'm mostly a web guy, right? So it there's other things that s- slow my code down and it's not the gill. Right. But I can see how if you're writing the kind of code that needs to make you that is pretty computational heavy and you need to use multi multi cores then this is this is a problem um so i can understand the pain i just wonder how many how many developers this really affects is this like a top one percent two percent problem of developers or most developers like me and who are building on the web or building small apps where it's not an issue i don't know the answer i'd just be guessing but there's a yeah, there's a bunch of surveys out probably that yeah. we could use as reference to get those numbers of like yeah, you know, yeah. data science versus and are people yeah. using C extensions and things like that. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's the problem, right? Is if uh, I think this is really cool work. I mean, this is the process of what two years, two years. Sam put two years of work into yeah. this full time. 
Yeah, set full time. Yeah, there's a lot of work, and I'm glad that I think we need uh, Python community needs to have people like Sam, where they're willing to push the boundaries and and kind of think outside of the box sometimes, and kind of try and push the language forward, even if it doesn't get merged. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned uh, that may you know whatever comes next can can right. benefit from. So I think this kind of work is really important for Python to move on as a whole, even if it's not implemented in its current state the whole python maybe it should be a python 4 thing i i kind of understand if there's no backwards compatibility you kind of break in semantic version and if you don't make it python 4 but i understand the reticence about that but then at some point we kind of have to move on as a community and kind of learn our lesson and kind of think well you know i i wasn't around for the python 2 to 3 transition in python yeah me too i'm kind of the same and and if you look at the the rise of python and and the areas in which python's become popular most of that happened after the transition so i would i would even argue that potentially there's a huge segment of the python community that wasn't there for that they just hear about it so you know at some point we've kind of got to move on um but i understand that they're in a tough situation with with doing something like that but you know lessons have have been learned and you, you, they won't make the same mistakes again. Right. So I don't know. I, I kind of a little ambivalent about the whole Python four um, situation, but I mean, if, if they do make it completely backwards compatible, then yeah, drop it in Python three point, you know, whatever number. So, uh, and that'd be great. And I think the backwards compatibility really is, really is the crux of this. If, if, yeah, if if there's no good backwards compatibility, this is just not feasible because it's just going to break. It's gonna it's gonna be worse than move, making it a Python four if you break backwards compatibility within a three dot version. Yeah, he's setting it up to, you know, as a project that will live in this thread of Python three nine, this sort of fork, and so people can test their C mm-hmm. extensions and and things like that and kind yeah. of go there. I would say the the big chunk of people that would get performance out of it would be in the data science world i i think that's one of the big ones Mm -hmm. yeah i think so and we've talked about it a lot on the show that there's this balancing act of yes sometimes it is all about raw crunching numbers but very often the advantages that python brings is just the the speed of development the ability to to not be sitting there and having to think about how to create this thing to actually stand it up on its legs and have it running within, you know, a day or so potentially depending on the project as opposed to longer development times. And so those are some of the, you know, other kinds of reasons. And like you said, like the work that Sam's doing looks like it also, you know, it's able, since it's open, other people can look at it and he's sharing it with the core developers and they're also seeing potential things that he's doing, you know, in those two years of, of research and, and development of creating this thing that could be implemented that don't necessarily involve completely removing the gill also. So mm-hmm. I don't know, it's interesting times. So I, it, those are both really good articles. If, if you're interested in learning a little bit more of what's happening, there's a, a, a lot of really cool movement happening in, in the core development of Python. And so I always kind of try to keep tabs on it if I can. <laughs> no, definitely. I mean, it's, it's, you got to keep your ear to the ground with the news. So you, it's part of your job, I guess. But uh, even even for me, you know, the, the more we were aware of these things, then um, the more we can participate in the discussions and, and kind of help move the language forward. Yeah. Security within software supply chains has become the major focus for developer and engineering teams. CloudSmith is a software supply chain management tool that provides public and private Python repository hosting for ultra-fast and secure delivery of your Python packages. CloudSmith is a fully compatible PyPI-like repository. With CloudSmith, you have the ability to develop your Python packages internally and privately share them with other teams across your organization. To get started with your own private Python repository, Visit cloudsmith.com slash sign up for more information. I went through the project yesterday and and built the content aggregator. And I think it's kind of funny because it's very, very, very meta <laughs> in the sense that you are building a 
content ag- aggregator for reading RSS feeds of podcasts. And the Real Python podcast is like your primary <laughs> example. <laughs> you, you added the, the Talk Python podcast, so it's kind of funny that let me bring you back on the the Real Python podcast to talk about your tool that reads the Real Python podcast. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, yeah, it was funny, but you know that the article was published, or the project, or whatever you want to call it, was published on Real Python, so it makes sense to yeah. to use the Real Python RSS feed. So yeah, yeah. But, um, well, no, I I enjoyed seeing all that stuff come up in 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 the in the feed as it went. That was really kind of cool. Hope, hopefully, it it didn't make you look at the feed and think, oh, I need to fix that. <laughs> hopefully, you didn't find any problems with your feed. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it looked like it's good. What's kind of your background? Uh, I, I should mention that it's it's a Django framework that the content aggregator is built on on top of. What is your background with uh, Django? It's always been something I've been interested in, but never kind of done professionally. So until kind of summer, I had my own um, web development kind of agency, uh, but Django was never something that I I got to use. Okay. So it's always been something that I've been interested in because of Python. And it, was, it wasn't the first web framework I used with Python. I think Flask was, but it was the one that seemed to stick, right, when I was first learning Python, uh, particularly web development with Python. I was doing web development before Python. but So it was the one that st- stuck. I liked the batteries included. I'd, I kind of have an overarching... Uh, I don't know, not irritation, I don't know, reluctance with, with frameworks that make me do the same thing over and over again just to set it up. You know, I, 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 I'm not a big fan of ceremony for the sake of ceremony. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, if, it's, if, it's the, if that code is the same and it's always going to be needed, well, then why is it there? Why do I have to write it? <laughs> you know? Sure. It's, I mean, I was actually it was uh, they just released C sharp uh, ten. I was keeping an eye at the .NET conf the other day, and they've done literally just that with with some C sharp. You know, the, all the ceremony with the static void main and and all that that you can remove that now. You don't need that anymore. That the the, um, the compiler just adds it for you when when you run. Was there much rejoicing from the community? I don't. I think there was there was some people that were very against it because it doesn't look like C Sharp as much anymore. Um, in fact, uh-huh. it, it's C Sharp starting to look a little like Python. <laughs> interesting. Which is interesting. But no, but I think I uh, I think for their community, it's important because um, because it helps people get in the door of the, you know, that first five minutes of, of learning, learning the language. It, it, it kind of redu- pulls down some of those barriers. That's interesting. Yeah. Microsoft has so many Python people there. Maybe it's well, a they do cross-pollination. <laughs> yeah, they do. And that's a good, that's a good thing for both right it's a, it's a good thing for us and it's a good thing for them and you know in my day job i don't write a lot of python these days i write a lot of powershell and oh, okay I, th- there's things i'm learning uh, by writing powershell that i was like oh, i wish python did this or and then there's things that i'm doing in python thinking oh why can't i do this this is so easy in python and so you you really kind of under appreciate the languages more when you know more than one language and yeah and move back and forth yeah, that's some general advice I, I kind of like to give people who are starting to code. Yeah, learn Python, learn it so you're proficient in it, but get something else because you don't know what's good about Python and what's bad about Python until you've experienced other languages and, and the way other people do things. Yeah, totally. Not there's, I think there's a lot of bad in Python, right? Um, and there's always ways around it, but there are, there are things that can be learned from, from one language to another in both directions, right? What web frameworks were you using before? you uh, got to Python and it sounds like you were doing web development for quite a while before that. Uh, yeah, about, f- yeah, I did, I did too much WordPress development. Um, <laughs> okay. I love, I have a love, I love, I have a love hate relationship with WordPress. Um, <laughs> sure. it's, it's just one of those things. So I was doing, I was focused on small businesses, uh, particularly local small businesses. And so they needed often simple sites. I wrote a few sites that were literally just like never going to change. And so that I literally just straight up HTML and CSS. That's all they needed. Right. Oh, so nice static all the whole way <laughs> yeah completely static all the way and you can make it pretty and but they they knew they never were going to change it right it was just basically a business card right yeah so a lot of wordpress i had a few tech companies that used things like hugo and pelican for okay so those were a little more uh, fun to work with but yeah so i think django H- having said that i'm also the president of a of a uh, 5013c nonprofit 
called Walkers One, and we a few years back we completely rebuilt our our failing web app and 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 rebuilt it with Django. So it, it's a full proper production web app so i do maintain that so that's i do have to keep an eye on django and and that's that's uh, most of my experience but I, all my little hobby projects they that i do um they usually start with django just because i want to get up and running quickly so what made you interested in creating this style of step-by-step project I, it was selfish reasons because I had an idea for a content aggregator I wanted to make for myself <laughs> as a side project. Okay, and then I saw, you know, I'm sure uh, the listeners are, are quite aware that we have just a, a gigantic Trello board with all our ideas on for for articles and things. And I saw that content aggregator was one of them, and I was like, I'll take it. I'll take that one <laughs> uh, because because then I got to learn how to build a content aggregator, which I then you know cloned and yeah. What were you aggregating in for your project, if you could talk about it? So, so the nonprofit I work, f- uh, I uh, preside over, is a nonprofit for people with uh, ankylosing spondylitis and, and uh, spondyloaxial arthritis, uh, which is a condition I have. It's a it's a chronic illness which affects more people than Parkinson's and MS combined. Yet, uh, it's a condition that not many people know about. It's probably because it's a mouthful to say and even worse to spell. But it's it's a chronic condition with no cure. And and, and so I do a lot in the community for that. And so I had an idea of making a, a, a kind of content aggregator around news in our community and, and helping other bloggers promote their, you know, their content and things. It kind of went a bit stale um, in the end because of my lack of time to put into it. But it, it started working for a little while. But yeah, so that was that was the project I was working on. It okay. Yeah, I mean, it's still it's still online. It's just not pulling in any news feeds anymore because I, I kind of put it on pause. But it's uh, if you go to spondy s p o n d y dot news, um, you'll you'll see you'll see it in its glory. Okay, uh, I'll link to that. As you kind of work through this and we're developing this project, what were some of the big hurdles, like technically, that you had to had to work out and it was nice to be able to have the <laughs> the the real python like article to do to help you you know focus some time on it i so i don't know uh technically it's uh, i got to learn more about uh, django custom commands and they're quite powerful once you learn about them i i wasn't familiar with them at all that i thought that stuff was fascinating yeah, I think that was the biggest thing. I mean, it wasn't overly difficult to learn. It was it wasn't a big technical hurdle, but it is something I did have to learn that I hadn't done before. And and then once you once you kind of get into it, you think, oh, this is really good. I can think of all these different re- different things I can I can use these for. So I think I think probably that I think the the, the biggest hurdle was was non technical though. It was scope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, scope was the biggest problem with uh, writing this article because uh, I mean, you always have a. a a kind of a reader in mind, the kind of person you think would would want to do this. And so it would be someone who roughly intermediate level who knows a little bit of Django. I don't go over basics of Django. There's other articles you can link to in the show notes for learning Django from Real Python. Yeah, we got a whole series. Yeah, it's great. The idea was that we wanted to go from setting up a project to finishing and having a working project. So you can have it as like a portfolio piece if you're looking for your first job or, you know, just a little side project and something you can change like I did to, for your own. So it's not about podcasts. It's about whatever you want it to be for something that you're passionate about. And so the problem I had was trying to select the technologies that would allow me to do it, do the job. Uh, but also that didn't have too much overhead and I didn't have to go on too many side branches to explain technologies and things. So one of them was for the, for the scheduling of the task, which maybe we'll come, we'll talk about a little later, but yeah, yeah, yeah. The scheduling of the task, we use a, a library called Django AP Scheduler, which is a, a Django version of AP Scheduler, which is a scheduling, uh, a task queue. There's other things you could have used. You could have used Celery or something, but I didn't want to go down the road of setting up like a RabbitMQ instance or something or or some kind of... What was that? What was that called? RabbitMQ. Hmm, okay. It's it's a big tangent. And so I was trying to... Now, if this was, uh, you know, getting a million hits a month, maybe I wouldn't choose Django AP Schedule. I'd have to see how it performed. But maybe I would go with something more like setting up uh, a RabbitMQ instance and using Celery or something to feed. Okay. 
feeds uh, tasks into the RabbitMQ task queue and, and and kind of do them that way on a on a on a larger production scale. But that's not that wasn't the point of the article, right? So I didn't want to. I, I I tried very hard to like not veer off because you get you get excited, right? When you when you know you know this from your courses, right? You get excited and you start going down these <laughs> sure. YouTube rabbit holes or whatever and learning about stuff. You know, like, hey, I got to kind of rein back in. This is this is going to be too much, and so you've kind of got to narrow it in. So so it was it was too using the technologies like that, that 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 would still get the job done uh, and still serve the purpose and and give the reader something to learn while also you know not adding too much complexity and making it too overwhelming and difficult for the reader yeah uh, which is the reason why i didn't use pytest in it either i there's actual tests in in this project as well we, we include unit tests so but i just stuck with the unit test in django built into django just because again just to try and although i use pytest Myself normally, I I wouldn't use unit the inbuilt unit test, but I, again, I, it was I didn't want another library to add, and right if they've never used Pytest before, I didn't want to you know then have to go down that tangent and explain. So it was kind of like trimming it back a little bit, <laughs> yeah, to to make it not be too overwhelming for the reader because it's still a pretty lengthy lengthy um, tutorial anyway. So yeah, yeah, I'm glad you included all the different portions. The the test is kind of nice, and and that is something that's kind of pretty well integrated into Django that you can you know literally run a test command to to run them and that that sort of integration is nice and could be a kind of a nice introduction to some of the fundamentals of testing before you dive headlong into something like pytest yeah i mean the tests in the article aren't you know they're, they're not as complete as they probably could be but they're just some basic unit tests just to because i i think if you're especially if you're using this as a portfolio piece if you want to stand out in an interview with your portfolio projects if this is your first job into getting your first job into tech if you have tests in your project you are going to stand out above most people (laughs) yeah because they don't they don't include simple unit tests for simple side projects so if you can show that you can test your code then you're already a step ahead of 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 a lot of people that that may walk through the door interviewing for that job. So uh, it was something that I learned when I was first getting into tech and I did some some tech interviews as well for companies and that was the thing I was given that specific feedback from people we loved that you included tests in your projects. <laughs> nice. Because it showed that I could test my code. So uh, that's that's something that I I kind of pass on to other people. It was given feed, good feedback I received and it's it stood up to be true and couple times and so i kind of passed that on as as and and you can see why right oh yeah it's kind of going to be part of the job so you got you got to if you know a little bit about it before you go in like they're going to have more confidence in your ability to to do the job right totally i didn't really see it as a as a full project until we had unit tests i've got nothing against like when you're going through tutorials and stuff yeah you're not gonna ha- you're learning something so you're not really gonna have unit tests but right like a different scope and focus. Yeah, because the purpose of this was literally you're going to build a whole project for you, then a whole project should include tests. Yeah. A couple areas I'd like to dive into, you already mentioned two of them, the Django custom command. I had not played with that at all, and I, I found it really kind of nice and really nice how it kind of implements into even the admin portion of uh, the Django framework, which is pretty cool. Maybe you could explain a little bit about what Django custom command is. Yeah, so Django custom command is a way of running a set of code within Django itself. So you would so what happens is it's kind of magic. So it's it's nice in that way for beginners that it just works. So you would you would particularly create a folder called management slash commands slash and then whatever your Python file is. And then what happens is when you st- when you start Django, uh, sorry, when you run uh, manage.py with Django, it will lock, if that is there, it, it'll register that as a command. So in in the tutorial, we have a start jobs.py file, which is, is the the main mechanism we use to go and fetch RSS feeds from the internet, pull in their contents, check to see if they're already in the database or not if they're not in the database we're going to add them to the database and in this and, and using the um ap scheduler to do that on on a timer yeah right so that's all kind of all in one command in this start jobs command so what you do from the command line is type python 
uh, manage.py start jobs. And then it goes and finds the start jobs file and runs and runs the script. Now, because we've, we've in, in the tutorial, it can be a one-off thing, right? You can just, you could have a start jobs for, I don't know, I mean, yeah, anything really. You could you could use it for linting or something like that, but probably not. Is probably not best use of Django's Django to do that. But you, uh, just a one-off text. Maybe you need to clean old articles out your database. There's there's one example. So um, you right. So if you you know if you're making a content aggregator, maybe you don't want your database swelling up with stuff from three years ago. So maybe periodically you go through and you just prune off stuff that's more than a year old, right? Sure. From your database. So you're especially if you're doing this as a side project. And you're hosting it on Heroku or something, and or move things into an archive or yeah, something like that. yeah, or something like that. Yeah, if it's if it's if it's something that's rotating a lot and doesn't maybe you don't want to keep that information around, you could create a, a prune database or something. You call it whatever you want file that would literally just go and do that task, and you can run it once from the command line. It runs itself. It's done. Because you're running it from the manage.py, then you get to access everything within Django itself. So you can use the ORM and, and all the things that are in, all the niceness that's included in Django to make your life easier. In in our instance, we we kind of just run it once and it starts in a separate thread. We open a, a new terminal and we because it's because it's going to run on a schedule and check every you know I think I forget how long we set it for like two minutes or something, uh, ridiculously short for the, for the sake of the tutorial but every like two minutes it goes off and tries to fetch the feeds and see what's new um, but you may run this you may have it running in the background you know infinitely in every hour or day or whatever it's going to run off and do a task so uh, yeah so start uh, so management commands are are pretty useful pretty useful to to do in django and like like you said you never heard of them and i, I hadn't before I had never used them before um, before this, and I'm really impressed with how well they work and how it has some of that Django magic. It just works, right? If you yeah. put the files in the right place, it just works, which is nice. Did you research them from the Django documentation, or did you find other resources? I think it was mainly the Django documentation. Okay, I may have, I may, I can't remember. I may have used other resources as I was researching, but I think for the most part, I use the Django documentation, and I think I may even link it in the article if I remember. Yeah, yeah, I think I do link. Yeah, so they're, they're pretty handy. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. Continuing with the theme of the episode, it's about Django, and it's titled Get Started with Django, Build a Portfolio App. The course is based on an article by Jasmine Feiner, and this course is presented by previous guest Martin Broyce. By the end of the course, you'll be able to understand what Django is and why it's a great web framework. You'll understand the architecture of a Django site and how it compares with other frameworks. You'll have set up a Django project and app, and you'll have built a personal portfolio website with Django. This course jumps you in and you start to learn by example. If you remember my talk with Martin back in episode four, he's a big fan of helping you work through the errors you may find along the way. Like most of the video courses on RealPython, the course is broken into easily consumable sections. You get code examples for the techniques shown, and all the courses have transcripts, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the newly enhanced search tool on realpython.com. Were you familiar with um, RSS? Uh, yeah, I'm one of those people that got upset when Google <laughs> Google killed yeah. off RSS reader. Yeah, I love RSS feeds. It's one of my favorite technologies, and it's, I don't know. I think it's very, very, um, I don't know you know, underused. Yeah. So I was familiar. Yes, I was. And I still get my news by RSS feeds. I still have an RSS reader um, I use, and I have some feeds I always try and keep an eye on. Which one do you uh, use currently? Currently using Feedly. Okay. Mostly because they, when, when Google killed off RSS reader, they literally threw out an ad to everyone in the world saying, if you use Google RSS reader, click this, you can, one click and import everything over and like okay uh, so go. yeah so like it's literally like you you sign in with your google account and they they pulled all all my stuff over like so like they made it super easy yeah and so they hooked they hooked me in that way and and now i pay them as well and everything so <laughs> <laughs> yeah i use a one called 
I, I mean, it's kind of a hybrid, but uh, Flipboard is the one that I've dabbled with on yeah, the iPad. I, I dabbled with that one too, yeah. but I, I like the, the more text-based ones. Then. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. There's one called Net Newswire that kind of got rebirthed on the Mac platform recently, which is, again, primarily like text-driven. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I enjoyed RSS too. I, I find it undervalued, <laughs> you know, as a way. You know, it's kind of like all these old, web technologies i feel like they're Mm -hmm. kind of almost going to become new again you know but we'll see (laughs) yeah we're getting there and i think our and it's one of the reasons why i chose podcasts as the subject matter for this i could have chose any topic right right Uh, the reason i chose our chose podcasts is because podcasts have rss feeds and rss feeds have to apply to a standard especially if they're being published to itunes or whatever you know you know you know more than this than i do but that there's a specification for rss which means that you can guarantee that every valid rss feed has certain elements right and if you're publishing to itunes they have extra elements that are itunes specific and maybe for the google play store they have their own too but they're known (laughs) <laughs> right. That's the hardest part when you're doing a content aggregator is if you're pulling in data and it's not known data and the format's not known because you, maybe you're pulling in uh, HTML, well, the HTML can change, right? right. So it, it gets hard to pass the, the data correctly. With an RSS feed, it's known what you're going to get. So it was very easy to almost in uh, to create functions that just do a that pass an RSS episode feed because all the feeds you're going to add are all going to look the same. So it helps, I think, someone you know, beginner stroke into lower intermediate level to kind of learn using maybe reusable code and object, not quite object orientated, but right, you know, in in that manner rather than writing out this is how i pass this feed this is how i pass the other because that's not maintainable if you've got 50 feeds coming in you want to you don't want to write the similar code 50 times just to pass that one feed so using an rss feed for the article was was something i intentionally did to try and again narrow the scope and keep the simplicity because all feeds are going to look the same so we can pass them with one function and and yeah add, add them with another function to the database so it, it made life easier. Um, plus, you know, I love RSS feeds. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was cool because then you could kind of create that. A very common thing you'll be doing inside of Django is creating, you know, models and views. Yeah. And so those became very, again, fairly standardized and everything sort of makes sense. It's not mm-hmm. this sort of fictitious project. You're, you're really working with standards that are out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So maybe we could talk a little bit about the the scheduler. What were some some hurdles with working with that? I, I, you could kind of go fairly deep into, you know, along with testing, another kind of nice thing that you add is uh, logging. Mm. Uh, so people can kind of practice some of that too. Uh, yeah, I don't know whether I went detailed into login. It's kind of a very... <laughs> Somewhat. You're at least touching on it. <laughs> I touched on it and we add login, yeah. I mean, login's important, right? You want to know if your scheduled tasks failed right. because the Django admin isn't going to tell you that unless you do some kind of custom admin magic. And by which case, and by which time, if you're able to do that in the Django admin, you're no longer in, you're probably no longer an intermediate or you 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 know your skill <laughs> level is above this article, right? So, which is great for you. Yeah. So so we we added some basic login to the output. But the, so the problems I had with the scheduler was the fact of is uh, we we decided to use the blocking scheduler. So essentially, it blocks off that whole thread. Uh, we we talked about threads earlier, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> so when you run the app in development and i'm going to separate it from production in development you will have two terminals open you'll have one running django and then one running your scheduler because you can't run the scheduler on the same process as django is running the uh it is running it doesn't end right when you run uh, manage.py run server it, it doesn't end so you can't then run in the in the same process because it's it's always yeah. going right and serving up html and all the Exactly, and, and the same is yeah. true for when we when we when we're running AP scheduler. So you've got these two terminals open. Now, if you were to go deploy this in in Heroku or something after you've done it, well, you're not going to be running. I at least I really hope you're not running manage.py run server in production. That's a development server. You should be using a proper server. So it kind of works out when you're in production because you, you, you it, having a blocking thread isn't a problem, right? I tried to use the uh, they have an async scheduler, but 
this was running on a before async was was in django i started this project so it was i could i could basically couldn't get it to work <laughs> is the, okay. is, is is the short version but maybe that'll change now because now async's in, in in that so maybe maybe this plain but i i don't do enough work with threads to to speak with any authority um so but using the scheduler, th- there wasn't any huge, huge technical hurdles. Although uh, the, there was, there is one, and uh, I pointed out in in it the way that adding a job to the schedule queue so then it can be added to the, to the Django admin works is you you kind of have to every job you have to create a new function and call. You can't like pass in like a so you you do like scheduler dot add job and then the first argument is going to be whatever the job is to add. So like fetch real Python episodes is one of the jobs, right? So so you would do that. The, there isn't a way of saying going doing a for loop for you know podcast in podcasts episodes or whatever you know and then schedule a add job and then add that in it, it, it doesn't work in that way so there is a little repetition of code which took me a little while to figure out it's just just because of how the scheduler works so okay that's it's minimal though but the, the the added benefit that 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 gave though is what i realized is well some podcasts may release two episodes a week and some may release one a week or every day right so right because you're because you're adding the, the jobs separately well you can also then specify the intervals separately you're not using the same interval for everybody so it, if the real python podcast comes out every friday morning while well, every friday morning you can set to 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 do that there's no point in doing it on a monday if you've already fetched it on a friday so yeah and talk python is a little more random than us um as far as i looked in the past like yeah. he just releases them when he releases them which is cool yeah yeah and different. then you know if whatever your there's some some that will release every day for whenever right right <laughs> and so you want to check every day yeah weekdays or whatever yeah so Although there is a little bit of repetition and it would have been nice to be able to do a for loop and add the jobs like that, you have this added benefit of actually, well, now I can actually specify what kind of trigger I want um, because a trigger can be a length of time or you can set it to like a cron job or there's different triggers you can have and, and some of those are covered. Most of these are intervals in the in the article. So, yeah, so it gives you that granularity that, you know, each feed can you can do something different with to save needlessly trying to fetch RSS feeds. Yeah, it makes sense. Although they're pretty cheap to fetch. <laughs> yeah. If, you, if you've got a hundred of them, it, it starts getting less cheap. So, Yeah, cool. At the end of the article, I like that you have a whole set of uh, suggestions uh, as to where people can take the project further. And you kind of give a leg up on a lot of the sort of styling stuff so people don't have to mm. sort of wade through that minutia of like okay well what is bootstrap and yeah uh you know this yeah. kind of initial layout stuff and 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 some of the other kind of like prettifying you're kind of focusing on the python part are there tools that you typically use when you do that kind of work like as far as uh you know generally like okay i'm, I'm going to use a framework or some other kind of tool to to style my stuff. I often do default to bootstrap just because I know it so well and I can get it spun up very quickly. I, I, there's a few that I want to kind of dig into. Tailwind seems to be very popular right now. So I at least need to use it to see whether I like it or not. What is Tailwind? Like I, I, I kind of know a little bit about it and I've thought about messing with it. Yeah. So Tailwind is, it, it, it's a way of it's a design system basically for for CSS, right? So in the way that boot, it's, it's very, very, it is basically a competitor to the Bootstrap, right? So if you know what Bootstrap is, then Tailwind's the same. They just do things a little differently. There's more granularity with the classes. And so your HTML have a lot of classes into them, but that allows for a bit more customization. The, one of the complaints often with Bootstrap is, uh, oh, you can tell a website's built on Bootstrap because they all look the same, right? Whereas, so there's a bit more customization with Tailwind wind okay cool and granularity which people like a lot but yeah uh, and so yeah i mean like you said i it was a conscious effort again keeping the scope down i didn't want people to have to f- fiddle around with html and css and you know leave a load of comments in the 
<laughs> right <laughs> on the article saying why is this not a player in and it ends up being a css problem not a python problem so we kind of this is about django this is about python this is about building a, a content aggregator using django and python so i wanted to take away again some of that complexity and so i I, I give you, when you start the project, you literally have a full Django project. You've, I've already done start project and you uh, have uh, all your HTML templates and CSS and images you need. And so you can just concentrate on the Python. And once your Python's working, then the whole site works, just works together. Yeah. And so it was a very conscious effort. And of course, one of the things you can do once you've built the project is then go away and fiddle with the CSS and the HTML and make it, make it your own, make it look different, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's always something to practice and mm. uh, build on top of it. It goes, you know, again, toward that idea that you mentioned earlier of, hey, potentially you could use one language your whole <laughs> career, but most likely you're going to be using several. <laughs> so especially if you're going to dabble in web stuff. Yeah, especially if you're dabbling in web stuff, you're going to need to learn HTML. Series. And, and most people probably could. But again, I, I didn't want it to be a, an article about writing HTML and CSS. I did start that way, uh, giving you the you know, copying and pasting HTML code in, in the article. I was like, I can just give it to them. If they're copying and pasting, I might as well just give it to them. If they're not actually got to write anything or learn anything themselves, there's no point in me adding it to the article. For them. It's just give, adding a, an annoying step they have to do to copy and paste code. I just give it them. Yeah, cool. I, I really enjoyed the project and I, I got a lot out of just kind of playing with it and some some new wrinkles for things me, for me to play with, you know, especially with the kind of ha- adding the commands and the scheduler and some of these other kind of ideas. And I, again, I'm a huge fan of RSS too. So I'm, I'm planning on taking my project a little further. <laughs> so thanks. That's cool. So I have these weekly questions, which you probably are somewhat familiar with. <laughs> yeah. I've listened once or twice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So what are you excited about uh, in the world of Python? Again, it could be a book package editor event, what have you. Uh, I guess this kind of, it's 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 neither of those things really. What I'm excited about is this change we've got over the last, I don't know, I want to say like eighteen months, two years, is the fact that we're now getting Python seems to be on the radar of a lot of big corporations. We now have you know Google sponsoring uh, Lukash to to be the developer in residence. Microsoft's now getting big into Python, and, and even Guido's now working at Python, helping Mike Python faster with uh, with his team there, and their team's growing, and so that the, any work they do is being funneled back into C Python core, and so I, th- that's what I'm I'm excited about. Yeah. In, in Python is the fact that now we're getting so popular that people are starting to take notice and that people and now money's coming back in and, and more support from big corporations is coming back into Python. And and just and like what we were talking about earlier with with Sam uh, Gross, he he's at Facebook, I think, right? So I mean that's what I'm excited about is the fact that now people are starting to take notice and now that's benefiting python because now we have a developer in reticence now we have people dedicated working on trying to make c python a little faster and guido and his team and and going forward that's only going to help us uh, as a community kind of grow python and make python better and more diverse and, and do all the cool stuff we want to do so that's what i'm excited about it's not against necessarily one piece of technology but the community as a whole how it's growing and and learning yeah and it's cool in a way that maybe these companies hadn't seen that model this light is shined <laughs> on like hey you can do it this way and let, let's kind of keep it going this way and it's it's working and there's a lot of effort kind of headed that way um it's definitely stuff i, would, I didn't hear my first two years of kind of dabbling in python and and it's i agree that it's definitely the last at least two years that it's been really becoming a big a big part of what's happening in the community and yeah i'm excited by it too it just means mm. i for me positive growth and and you know continuing the exciting stuff that's happening with python in general in the development of the language i mean you could probably look at it a little cynically and say they had you know um their own personal interest in heart when they started doing this stuff you know they want people on their platform and python's really hot popular so let's support python and people will use our platforms more but right. uh, and that maybe it started that way i don't know but um but i don't think it stayed that way and i think the companies are now are starting to realize the the power of open source and community and and kind of you know there's this give and take right yeah totally 
So what do you want to learn next? I think immediately next, I need to dig into pattern matching, which came in 310. I haven't, I know kind of, I know kind of on a high level, I've kind of seen articles around. I I haven't read much about it, but I I know of it. I just haven't had time to dig into it. So I think the next thing Python wise is I'm going to dig into that and uh, actually get to play with it and and see what I can do with it. And then the other thing is I'm currently learning, uh, partly for the day job, uh, more about Python packaging. Okay. Yeah, so I'm working. Uh, I'm excited for Dane's book, Dane Hillard, who's been on the the podcast before. He's um, yep. actually not too long ago, I think, talking about his book on Python packaging. So I already have, you know, I bought the pre-release version and I uh, have the chapters that is released so far, and I'm reading through that. So if you're listening, Dane, hurry up and write it because I, I kind of <laughs> need it. Yeah, because because that that's how it works, right? That's how it works, right? I just saw a post this morning. Uh, he said for the rest of the year, he's taking Fridays off to work on the book. So yeah, no, I'm, <laughs> so I, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I have, I, I, and I've had Dane's other book for a while and I really enjoyed how he, how he writes. So yeah, it's very cool. So yeah, I mean, you know, one author to another, you kind of appreciate, appreciate good writing. So yeah, I, so I'm, I'm looking forward to finishing Dane's book when, when it's finished, uh, no rush, but, uh, <laughs> it's, but yeah, I really want to dig into Python packaging more because I think it's a, it's an area we need to work on. I mean, we talked about yeah. the, the gill being a problem in Python possibly for especially people in data science, but Python packaging is still yeah. a problem in Python that needs to be fixed. So, but, and, and I can't, I need to learn, learn more about it to, uh, to be able to form a a huge opinion on it and, and kind of even help move it forward maybe, but you know, I got to, I got to start somewhere. So I'm learning, that's, that's what I'm learning right now. Cool. So we kind of end the episode with some shout outs. So, or plugs, um, do you have anything you want to shout out or plug currently? Not specifically. So in the summer, I started a new job as a DevOps lead for a cybersecurity company. And so I'm actually hiring. So if you're interested in becoming a DevOps engineer and doing a bit of Python, but also PowerShell and working with open source tools and and help develop open source projects and integrations, then yeah, hit me up on Twitter and I'll send you the link. I uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm Endless Tracks. That's E N D L E S S T R A X. Um, I'm Endless Tracks pretty much everywhere on the internet, on any social media, bar LinkedIn, you know, I'm Endless Tracks. And my website is endlesstracks.com. And if you want to play me at chess, play me <laughs> <laughs> That's right. On chess.com. Yeah, I'm Endless Tracks there. So basically plug that name into Google search and you'll see a lot of stuff about me. Uh, I've had that handled for a long time. So I've got pretty pretty good seo (laughs) and so i'm never changing it i'm never changing it (laughs) (laughs) yeah there you go hey well ricky thanks so much for coming on the show it was really fun to talk to you it's my pleasure anytime remember security within your software supply chain is crucial for your organization visit cloudsmith.com slash sign up to build your private python repository today i want to thank ricky white for coming on the show And I want to thank you for listening to The Real Python Podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that The Real Python Podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.